Good morning and a warm welcome to the very last panel discussion of this year's Munich Security Conference. And I think maybe it's allowed to take my mask off. <laughs> it's an honor and a pleasure to be your moderator. And the idea behind our panel discussion, Back to Elysium Fostering European Cohesion, is very much to bring the internal debate into the discussion. Um, without European cohesion internally, there cannot be a global capacity to act. Without the European Union being united, um, without um, having agreement on what the European values are, um, we cannot be a forceful international actor. So in the next 19 minutes, we will discuss how to strengthen European cohesion, how to bring citizens on board. We will uh, discuss European values. Um, and I'm super glad that I don't have to do this all by myself. I have a group of very distinguished speakers. Um, and to kick us off, the Croatian Foreign Minister Gordon Grelish Radman will set the scene. And after that, we will continue with the panel discussion. Minister Radman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Due to some unexpected circumstances, my Prime Minister unfortunately could not uh, participate today and I will address on his behalf. Esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, decision-making process in the EU was always complicated and as a, as a result, of course, difficult. Anyone who ever served in Brussels knows that. But it was designed to be that why, as it had to take into account to complex, the complex set of challenges that laid ahead of their founding fathers. The name just a few. There were big and small member states by population, size or economy. There were and there still are richer and poorer member states. In addition, the situation inside them differs greatly between their regions. Then there were different cultures, languages, and conflicting histories whose weight was very much palpable or tangible in 1951 when the two main vectors of economy at that time, at that time coal and steel, were used to create a bedrock of the future community. EU's complex decision-making process was designed to ensure that no one is excluded and, and that uh, every voice is heard. It was hard, it was tasking, but in the end it was rewarding. And it was all worth it. The foundations of the European Union were laid, the most successful peace projects in history. However, all of this implied the political and social elites functioning of the same frequency, which again implied the high level of knowledge and understanding of the European project's goal and corresponding readiness to invest work and energy in it. Peace and prosperity, their protection and assurance was always present in the background of the stakeholders' thinking process. We are not functioning in the same reality today. Today we live in a world of ultimate and dual social network democracy that puts pressure on democratically elected leaders in unprecedented ways. Current generation of voters forgot the horrors of 20th century wars and the economy and technology developed in a way that makes instant gratification a golden standard for everything and everyone. In essence, the success of our civilization became our liability. The somewhat closed public sphere of the second half of the 20th century that enabled the political, civil service, academic and media leaders to develop current EU is no more. Of course, the criticism existed back then, but it was directed through 
the systemic channels then that made it constructive and thus produced better outcomes. In its interplay of politics, academia, civil society and free media, that was liberal democracy at its best. Would it possible to reach the same agreements today with the pressure that is created by some organization and individuals who are regularly putting pressure on political leaders via the internet? In other words, if we decided to renegotiate EU's cohesion or agriculture policy above, how far would we get in the world where solidarity is mentioned, uh, mentioned a lot but practiced a little? Not to risk sounding one side, wars such as responsibility and ownership have also fallen into disuse in many places and they are precursors to functioning democracy under the rule of law. This is the challenge we face today, as each of our negotiations become harder and harder and leaders experience unprecedented pressures from the public sphere, which make every voice, however extreme it might be, resonate far and strong. Now, how do we exclude even censors the extremes while defending the free, free speech, one of our most cherished values and accomplishments. Keep in mind that in all of this, some leaders trying to survive their confrontation with their irresponsible populist dis disruptors, disruptors that have appeared from nowhere and even if they often do not last long, poison and alter the public discourses forever, succumbed and started playing similar game that often includes blaming Brussels. But if we want to save our values-based union, the elected leaders need to stop blaming Brussels for anything as Brussels only produces outcomes we all participate in creating. We also need to give each other a benefit of doubt. We need to listen and hear each other. We share the same values, but we are different, united in our diversity. But we are all under pressure of alternative facts and cheap lies. Literally cheap, as launching them via the internet does not cost a lot. Our citizens and voters are confused between market forces and advertising, chase for the last cent of profit to the conspicuous forces hiding in the darkness of the cyberspace from foreign governments, systemic challengers, terrorists, or plain criminals. We are being bombarded. In every move we make to address this necessarily a crackdown of democracy where God knows who is meddling in our public discourse. It's everything that is today defined a civil society movement by a definition pro-democracy. Pro are corporations or non-governmental organizations to be taken for granted as actors for the good? How do we find out which one is good and which is bad? And what is their source? of funding and underlying goal. Are all of us, our societies, equally vulnerable or are there best practices to follow? Can different ideas be applied in another context? I know I did not answer, uh, I did not answer any of the key questions, but I have opened a lot of them. Hopefully, the panel that follows the esteemed colleagues on it will be able to provide some useful contribution uh, to our deliberations and address the key problem of our day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Minister Ratman, for these thoughts on democracy, civil society, the rule of social networks, and the gap between Brussels and citizens. Um, 
I'm sure we will come back to uh, many of these thoughts in our discussion. And I would like to welcome now um, the speakers uh, of my panel, the Prime Minister of Estonia, um, Kaya Kallas, uh, Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander de Croo, uh, Minister Alvarez of Spain, and Mr. Uh, Friedrich Merz from Germany. And I'll introduce them later uh, while I address them. Please join me with a round of applause to welcome our speakers. I'm, I'm actually super happy that we have this set up here because we have representatives from a, a kind of a variety of uh, European uh, regions. We have basically northeast, south, west, and the center. And we have small member states, big member states. And I think this allows us to have a variety of different uh, positions. So the central question is European cohesion and basically keeping uh, the club together. There have been many problems in the past, um, Brexit, the migration crisis, the management of the coronavirus crisis. So we had the impression that the European Union was basically in constant crisis mode and that there were no good news um, and that there was kind of um, a lack of cohesion, a lack of solidarity. Um, and starting with the Eurozone crisis, and we talked a lot about this. So I want to ask you for your personal assessment of the situation. Um, you are dealing with European affairs on a daily basis, um, and I'll start with you, um, Prime Minister Kallas. You are the first female Prime Minister of Estonia, and I say this because I think, as a woman, I think it's uh, uh, fantastic news. But you were also a member of the European Parliament, so you know the EU quite well, you know the Parliament, you know the institutions. And so looking at your experience in the European Parliament and now um, as a Prime Minister, how do you assess the state of European cohesion? Is it as bad as one would guess kind of looking at uh, the series of crises that we had faced? Yes, first of all, thank you for this question, but uh, I was just thinking that the world is in constant crisis and Europe is part of the world, so it's not the European crisis altogether. Um, but uh, we have to deal with those. And, and I must say that, uh, uh, you know, crisis really unites. And every crisis gives us lessons uh, to be more resilient to uh, in, in next crisis. For example, um, this uh, health crisis that we are having now, uh, then was based uh, or the solutions were very much based on the lessons we learned from the debt crisis uh, because you know all the um, uh, funds that were uh, immediately agreed uh, to, to distribute and, and to act together in order to get the vaccines uh, and uh, and first uh, it was a lot of criticism that uh, you know Europe it takes time but we have never uh, I mean moved so fast and if you look in the longer run then um, you know all the statements were made by other regions but uh, but Europe got its act together and actually we moved fast and, and got the vaccines as well. And also for a smaller country like, like ours, um, in, uh, when there was a swine flu and we didn't act together, then, you know, the big... Uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, they wouldn't sell vaccines to us because we were too small uh, and, and the amounts that we needed were so small. Uh, so so uh, we uh, coupled up with uh, France, uh, you know, buy some for us as well. But but in this case, actually, it is, you know, for everybody. Uh, and and we were, uh, we were part of this, which is, I think, very good. And one other thing that I want to say, I mean, we have global global um, uh, crisis, climate crisis, and, and especially when we were in, in Glasgow, uh, where there were like 149 leaders of the world, and uh, there, uh, you know, I really felt the Team Europe. We, we might fight, you know, inside and debate inside those rooms, but when we are in the world, you know, it's a region where uh, 27 leaders uh, of different countries meet like every third month, uh, discuss thoroughly all the aspects that there are, and, and when we are outside, we are together, and, and this feeling is very strong. So 
you mentioned um, the expectations of uh, European citizens already, and you mentioned the coronavirus crisis management as a positive example. But I want to test this, because um, the European Council on Foreign Relations last year, one year after the crisis um, has hit us, conducted a survey between 12 member states. And it was at the height of um, yeah, the, the problem uh, to get the vaccines. And there was a huge amount of frustration throughout the European Union, especially uh, in Germany and France, uh, a rise of uh, Euroscepticism because the sentiment was that the European Union does not deliver. So for me, European cohesion is not only about the cohesion between member states, but very much about European citizens uh, sticking together, having also the impression that the European Union uh, serves uh, their purposes. So how do we get the European citizens better on board? And is the kind of the famous conference on the future of Europe, which was meant to be a means to achieve exactly that, is, is it, do you think it's a successful process? Well, um, from the citizen side, um, uh, there was a survey uh, of uh, what, what is it, why, you know, European citizens value European Union, what, what is it for them, and and the main response was free movement of people, goods, services, and it was the first thing that was hit during COVID crisis. You know, everybody closed their borders, which is, I think, a very very um, a dangerous sign because if this is the value that the citizens see in the European Union, and it's the first thing that uh, you know goes out of the window when we have crisis, then we have to think about that. Uh, how is the future of the European Union going to? be, uh, and, and especially when we're going to have, you know, migration crisis, um, such issues where the countries really, you know, uh, the first instinct is to, you know, uh, somehow protect uh, its own borders and its own uh, country, but, but I think together we are much uh, stronger and we have to avoid uh, really, uh, you know, also the mental borders between uh, uh, our countries. Thank you very much. I'll do a first round with all of you, um, but then later, if you want to react to each other, just um, give me a sign, and then I also, after the first round, of course, will open it up uh, for you uh, to, um, uh, to give you a possibility to ask your questions. So, uh, Prime Minister uh, de Croo, um, following up on the Conference of the Future of Europe, I want to test uh, an idea with you. Uh, the new German government, when it came into office, wrote an ambitious coalition treaty. One of the ideas was to launch a process, kind of through the Conference um, of the Future of Europe, um, that would then lead in the end uh, to a European federal state. That is the ambition that is uh, stated there. So what kind of reaction did that trigger uh, in Belgium. Do you think that would help us to really uh, kind of create European co cohesion through a European federal state? I mean, it, in itself, I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. But I think, honestly, the last thing we need in Europe now is a big ideological debate on does it have to be federal or does it have to be something else? That would lead to years of discussions and it's not going to get us very far. So. I'm not against it, but I'm not really thinking that is the, that is the solution. What you actually see, I mean, connecting with, with what um, Prime Minister Kala said, I think, first of all, in times of crisis, we do show unity. And that's good. We've done it with Brexit. We've done it in the vaccine campaign. We do it now in this geopolitical crisis. We show unity. But we don't show unity in the other dimensions, where we should not be reactive, but where we should take the lead. And we should take the lead, it's actually a bit harder to, uh, to do it. And I think that when people say Europe fails, that's what they mean. Because what you see these days is that, I mean, the European project used to be pulled by visionary leaders that came with great ideas and they pulled everyone forward with ideas where often people said, do we really need this? And then people were convinced afterwards. I think now it's actually switched around. What you see is that there's a push from the population. It's not the visionary leaders that pull uh, Europe forward. It's the population that expects more. And so when population says Europe fails, it's on that element of we expect more. And you see that with COVID in principle, this is not a European topic. But the population said, you know, member states are not up to speed, not, are not up to, to, to capacity to do this. Europe should do it. It's the same with the energy crisis. 
the population says the European Union should come with an, with, with an answer. And you feel that younger generation is pushing us forward. And that's the thing we should, uh, we should respond to. But I don't think to that demand for more European effectiveness, I don't think the answer is a big institutional debate. And you know, institutional debates, we Belgians, we know all about this. <laughs> this is a national sport and state reforms, you know when it starts, when it ends, it's more difficult. What really the goal was, once you have a decision, was it really why we started? That's often doubtful. So I'm in itself not a big, big fan of that. Okay. Can I ask you another question uh, when it comes to expectations of citizens? Um, and that is actually to deliver on the rule of law and yes. uh, kind of to save uh, mm -hmm. European democracies from democratic backsliding. Um, so the EU is a community of law, but also of values. And there is uh, a huge debate uh, within member states what, what that really means. I mean, mm -hmm. and just on Wednesday, the Court of Justice of the EU issued that landmark ruling that Brussels now can cut uh, funds to those countries that are not respecting the rule of law. So it gives power to the Commission to apply the um, rule of law mechanism for the first time. Do you think that um, this will bring us forward in this debate to create more unity and cohesion on the matter, uh, kind of what rule of law really uh, should mean uh, for the European Union and what European values uh, really are? Do you think Poland and Hungary and other countries will likely embrace the ruling and say, yeah, now finally uh, we see the light and uh, we follow uh, the direction of the European uh, Commission? So is it likely to um, increase tensions or to ease tensions? Well, I think it is indeed a landmark decision, and it's crucial that the European Court of Justice uh, took a decision on that, and, and it comes to the essence of the European construction. I mean, you see these days, what is the value of Europe? Is that if you're confronted with a big external partner, mm -hmm. what they love to do is to intimidate small countries. If you're a 130 million inhabitants country, it's easy to intimidate small small country in population, yeah, yeah, apologies, really. <laughs> of 1.3 million inhabitants, that easy. It's harder to intimidate a block of 27 countries. And what we often hear is in our interactions with external countries is they say, well, but why are you giving away your sovereignty to this European construction? This is crucial. We member states, and especially the smaller member states, we took a choice to give away a part of our sovereignty. Now, the other side of giving away part of your sovereignty is respect for rule of law. If respect for rule of law is not guaranteed, then it's extremely hard for us to give away a part of our sovereignty. So it's the essence of the European, uh, of the European construction. If you want it to continue to work, then I need to be sure that the part of the sovereignty I give away is respected in the rest of the country. Now, that decision is a landmark case. But let's be clear, this is not only a legal discussion, it's also a political discussion. And we're not going to solve a political problem with a legal answer. So, the decision of the European Court of Justice is a first step. But afterwards, it's up to us politicians to use it and to come to a political agreement on how you do this. And so it would be a mistake, just like in the financial crisis, where actually we outsource the solution to the ECB. Here, you cannot outsource the solution to the political problem we have to the European Court of Justice. We also need to take this in our hands. So if your question is, is this decision going to change everything? No, but it's important, an important first step for us to act upon. And you think it will create a positive dynamic? I think it should. Okay. And if, it, if, it, if it's not, then we have, a, we have a problem. I mean, we, up to now, we've talked about unity and about the positive things, but we shouldn't be overly optimistic. I mean, we have our issues within the European construction and the, rule of law, the respect to the rule of law, obviously, is, um, is, is one of them. So we, we need to solve this. Mm -hmm. But we have solved our issues before, and Europe, take steps forward in moments of crisis, and this is one of them. Thank you very much. So I'll address a couple of topics, and then later in the discussion we can um, dive deeper into some of the issues. But now over to Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation, José Manuel uh, Álvarez Bueno. 
Uh, very welcome um, on this panel. And um, I would like to ask you a question on, again, the coronavirus crisis and its management, but more the fiscal angle of it. Um, so this crisis, um, certainly had the potential or still has the potential to further amplify regional disparities and uh, social economic um, inequality. So there is now a huge push amongst some member states to reform the EU fiscal framework um, because the fiscal impact of the COVID crisis uh, makes reform unavoidable, um, some member states say. So this whole discussion um, is very uh, loaded, um, the, the future um, of the European uh, Economic and Monetary Union, fiscal union, how, how, um, yeah, how to develop this further. Some member states are completely against uh, kind of the uh, next generation EU uh, being a role model for future uh, crises. Other member states think this is a good idea. Where does uh, Spain stand on all of this? The, the coronavirus crisis has put a completely different light on European Union. Uh, for the last decade, uh, we can say, uh, European Union has been perceived by a lot of our citizens as something distant, very far away from everyday needs and wishes of uh, our citizens, very bureaucratic and very slow. The reality is that facing the a biggest crisis in the last century, European Union, without any previous plan, was able to move very quickly to directly address the needs of the citizen, first with the vaccine, and then with an economic plan, the next generation instrument that will support both the economic crisis and the social crisis. So all, the three of, of, of the coronavirus crisis, the health, the economic and the social, were tackled mm -hmm. in only a few months. And I think anyone in this room, and I think anyone in the European Union, uh, can find this as one of the biggest successes mm -hmm. of the European Union in many, many years. So if that's the right path, why to stop it? Exceptional times are that what the coronavirus has shown, and, and that's where Spain stands. Exceptional times will need exceptional decisions. And I stress the, the, the word exceptional, the objective exceptional. Of course, Spain is totally committed. We are a very pro-European country. We are a very pro-European uh, government and we are totally committed and engaged with fiscal uh, uh, rules. But this is, these are very exceptional times in which we need to rethink what we've been doing uh, previously. If we compare how we got out of the previous crisis, and the cost, the social and even the economic uh, cost of, how, uh, of, of that crisis compared to how we are dealing this one, it's very clear which one is the right path. Concerning the cohesion that you were asking, this um, crisis put countries and put pressure to uh, spread away the countries. The next generation EU instrument is meant also to keep cohesion not only to allow us not to move farther away, but even to make the right transition. It's not only for recovery, this instrument, also for transition, and to do transition in, in the digital area, in, in the Green Deal. So we will bring together our region within our own countries and the countries of Europe, the member states together. Actually, that's one of the four axes of our national plan, the cohesion the internal cohesion among region, but also the cohesion among the different European uh, Union countries. So this is an excellent time because history forces us to do it, to rethink the fiscal rules exceptionally, not renouncing, of course, to the debt control, and at the same time to take this instrument, the next generation uh, instrument, to bring us together. Cohesion at the end is one of the objectives of the European Union. One thing that uh, I greatly admire of Spanish European policy lately is its ability to, um, yeah, to 
uh, create alliances beyond basically the usual suspects. So the um, non-paper on strategic autonomy uh, with the Netherlands, I think, was very remarkable. And also, I know that um, uh, kind of uh, with Estonia, there are kind of special ties. So, um, do you think that the way Spain interoperates within the European Union lately, kind of having this kind of flexible alliances and purpose-driven uh, cooperation. Is that a, a model for enhancing a European cohesion, also bridging uh, maybe existing gaps, bringing kind of the frugals closer to the south? I hope so. I hope that's a model for, for two reasons. One, if you want, is an intellectual reason. It's clear that what unites us within European Union is much more that would make us different. And sometimes I see uh, a part of, of, of the political parties in European Union putting too much stress in our difference that are really teeny compared to all that unite us. And the second one, we are convinced as a government, as a country, but it's an evidence to us. Most of the biggest challenges that we are facing right now, individually as national countries, only have uh, united and European answer. You can take uh, climate change, irregular migration, security threats, now that the Ukrainian crisis is every day in the news, so energy rising prices. So if the scope of the problem is European, the answer can only be European. To try to create the impression that we can give individual national solution is just lying to our public opinions. Thank you very much. Now I turn to Friedrich Merz, who is since January uh, and with a great election result, the chairman of the uh, CDU, um, and since a couple of days also the chairperson of the CDU um, party group, at uh, CDU CSU party group. So uh, welcome to this panel. And Mr. Merz needs, needs to leave uh, a bit earlier. Um, so whenever I open um, the discussion for questions from the audience, you might want to ask every question you have uh, for, for Mr. Merz first. Um, but uh, now I take my privilege to ask you a question. Um, so you are here also to represent basically the German approach to the European Union or the Christian Democratic approach, more, I think more precisely to the European Union. So um, coming back to what I already asked uh, Prime Minister de Croo, how was your reaction when you read the new German uh, coalition treaty, especially uh, its part, uh, parts on Europe? I know that you are on record saying that the Greens did a pretty good job in securing kind of access to the European Union, Coreper 1, Coreper uh, 2. So, um, so so when you read this, were, was your impression that Germany was on the right path to be what the coalition uh, treaty says, um, to, to basically fulfill its special responsibility um, as a leader in the European Union, a special obligation uh, mm. that, is, that is stated in the coalition treaty? Well, first of all, let me say that I made my schedule so that I can stay until one o'clock here. Ah, it's no problem. Wonderful. Me. Yeah. I made it. <laughs> So, um, I take that as a compliment for the discussion. <laughs> okay. It's my pleasure. Um, first of all, let me make one preliminary remark. Um, I was firstly elected in a political position in 1989 to the European Parliament. And I spent five years in this uh, Parliament. And that made my, how should I say, my political reasoning until today. And um, that's the reason why I'm still very optimistic about the options the European Union actually has. And for me, the European glass is always half full and not half empty. And if we look back to the last two years, when we met here in 2020, nobody could have imagined what the upcoming two years would mean for all of us. And from today's perspective, I think we can say that we really again achieved a lot. Just only one look at the process of approvals of new vaccines. This was the shortest period of time ever in an approval process for new vaccines in the European Union and worldwide ever. And we made it. The only point we have to make today from the retro perspective that the system of taking orders and the distribution 
failed. But the approval process was a real success story for all of us, and this is something which is valuable for the entire future on this special market. So now back to Germany. Germany is one of the founder states of the European Union, and this has always been our political obligation. We are in the strategic center of this European continent, and that's the reason why always Germany has a big obligation to bring this European policy and this European Union forward into our common future. And if we are now think or believe or have to believe that we are on the eve of a bigger conflict on this European continent, we are seeing all the challenges and all the differences we are faced with. We are still lacking of a European integrated uh, foreign security policy. And my personal view, you have not to share that, but my personal view is from this experience in the European Parliament and on, the European, on European policy, we have to talk about the unanim unanimous vote on foreign security policy. The process of bringing the uh, political and judicial order um, on the way in this European Union and the decision you mentioned from the European Court last Thursday are demonstrating that this was only the second choice. Why couldn't we take the first choice? Because there is unanimous vote. So if we are, if we should talk about, or we should talk about, let me put it this way, how we can overcome from case to case, not in general, but from case to case and step by step, the unanimous vote on foreign security policy in this European Union. We could make some further progresses in this area where, in my view, is the deepest lack of competency and strength of the European Union. And that is the lesson which we are learning, actually. And, and, and if I go home from this con conference uh, in the afternoon, my takeaway is that this awareness has never risen in a so short period of time so dramatically up than in this conference on this weekend that we have to do more on this. And this is the outcome for me which makes me extremely optimistic about the future of Europe. So, but I want to push you more on the current uh, European a German-European um, policy and also your ideas for it. So you're in opposition now um, with uh, the CDU uh, and the CDU-CSU parliamentary group. What are your ideas how to basically um, accompany this process of European uh, policy of the new German government? So what are your ideas? What, what do you want to push forward? What, where do you want to basically chase the new German government? Well, the, the, the normal way to proceed on that is that the government has to make some proposals and to bring some ideas forward and then we react on that and either we agree or we are disagreeing and giving alternatives to that. And that's the normal way how we are proceeding in this process now, a new government and we are again, third time in our history, in the opposition role. We take that and we will fill that out. But we are coming from a long-standing tradition in my party. And just let me mention one of my predecessors who presented in 1994 a paper how to proceed within the European Union, not only in taking new members as full members immediately, but to have an integration process step by step, and they named it uh, circles with different integration depth of the European Union. That was Wolfgang Schäuble in 1994. And surprisingly for me, I was reminded today in my one-on-ones on this position, which is now almost 30 years old, that we could come to some sort of different integration steps towards the European Union. Let, let me just uh, mention the Western Balkan which has to be integrated in the European policy step by step, but this could be something we will debate on in the European, in the, in the German parliament and in public in this country. And this country, um, this is my final remark on that, this country is still very supportive 
for European integration, even though we have some problems and some complaints which are justified, but the general mood in Germany is still a vast majority beyond all these, these people on the street crying and all these uh, um, uh, people there out there, the vast majority of Germany is still and will remain favorite in favor for further European policy and integration. Do you think that would also be the case if uh, the European Union now in this crucial question on fiscal unity, if there would be a majority um, in Germany to um, support the uh, kind of EU next generation fund as a role model for future crises. So, because that has traditionally been a very toxic topic in our German public, right. and especially voters of your party or the Liberal Party are very much against it. So, what do you say to this idea or this kind of that we are in, a, in an exceptional situation and that what we have done now with the recovery fund is just yeah. not enough? Is that what you would support or what you would Thank you for caution the question. for? And I give you a very clear answer. Mm -hmm. This is not a Hamilton moment. Okay. And this is the difference between the government, at least the chancellor. I don't know what the, the gov entire government is thinking about that. For example, the finance minister, he never mentioned that. But this is the difference. This is an exemption for a special situation we never were faced with. But this should not be the normal case that the European Union is refinancing its budget on capital markets. So this is an exemption for such a situation we were never faced with. But then we have to come back to the rules and these rules are the stability and currency framework which we implemented 20 years ago. I was spokesman for the implementation of the euro in the national parliament then and I stick to what I told the, the electorate in Germany then that we will have a stable currency and a limitation of public debt. Thank you. I give you all a short um, moment for if, if you want to make any remarks uh, towards what has been said and then finally I open it up so you can prepare kind of uh, how you want to make yourself uh, seen. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to uh, reflect uh, what Alexander said uh, about the federal, federal Europe. Uh, I sometimes, when I meet with people, then I ask the questions. Do you want, do you want to, you know, uh, uh, that Europe uh, has a unified banking uh, control or regulation? Yes. Uh, European defense? Yes. Uh, do you want, uh, I mean, the vaccines, uh, uh, common, common approach to this? Yes. Do you want federal Europe? No. So actually, the answers to you know this question that form a federal uh, federal uh, approach to this, but I don't know. It's it's such a red flag also for Estonian public, and and I wouldn't go into that uh, discussion. But uh, I think it's it's the essence what we do. And the other thing that I wanted to comment is. It's the rule of law. Um, uh, our uh, f first president, after uh, we uh, got our independence back, uh, he said something like this, that Europe is not geography. Europe is, you know, set of principles and how we stay true, those, uh, true to those principles. So uh, that the geography doesn't make the principles, but the principles make, um, make uh, geography. And, and I think this is very true to the rule of law, but I, I've tried to approach uh, this aspect, uh, you know, talking to my uh, Polish colleagues, uh, saying that it is beneficial to your country. <laughs> I mean, because if, if the investors trust your legal system because it's based on the rule of law principles, that means that the investors make investments to your country. That means, you know, uh, prosperity for your people. So actually it's beneficial to follow uh, the rule of law uh, when it, it gives the certainty. And and, and this is, I think, a very important uh, point to explain uh, to the people as well, because yesterday I was in a debate and, and somebody said that nobody would ever die for the rule of law in the fight. Well, uh, but actually they would, uh, I mean, I, I could defend uh, the rule of law uh, because it is actually beneficial to uh, the people. For example, in our um, own practice, 
um, since we joined the European Union, our, our salaries have grown 40 times. Uh, uh, pensions have grown 60 times. Uh, so it is good for our people because the investors come and economy prospers. So you can make a very good case to your citizens why it is a good thing to absolutely, be Absolutely, absolutely, uh, that this is actually, you know, a principle to, to you know, stand Thank for. You. So, brief interventions from you? Yeah, maybe on, on, on the point on fiscal capacity. Of course, every, everything is temporary until it's permanent. <laughs> and, and, and that's the issue, of course, is that if you say it's temporary, but we start using it over and over again, then it becomes uh, structural. So, I think, honestly, let's, let's just use what we have. I mean, what we have done is groundbreaking. I mean, this, this Recovery and Resilience Fund is something this was non-discussable for such a long time and then countries which were against this moved let's put it in the practice let's see how it goes let's also look at the conditionality because there's a tendency to talk about investment mm -hmm. volume that's good but there was conditionality on reforms and so on let's do that first well mm -hmm. and then we'll have a, a, a discussion afterwards but but i'm always a bit afraid of this idea of oh it's a crisis you know we will have crisis i mean we, in a, we are in a world where we're, we will always be confronted with crisis. And I'm a bit afraid to use that crisis mode to then do something which we do not really master enough. Okay. Minister Alvarez? Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, a, a couple of comments. On, on the debate on, on federalism or not federalism, uh, it was already said there are there are many achievements of the European Union that are already federal, if we can uh, call it that way. Actually, the, the two biggest one in the last decades, the Euro and the, and the Schengen area are federalistic mm -hmm. achievements. And I think uh, most of our citizens consider them greatest success and we couldn't live as, as we do it. Uh, I think that the, the, the wrong approach, and that's why it's so hard to have that sort of debate on, on federalism in Europe and why it has become uh, so complicated to, to, to tackle it is because uh, almost as a fake news, uh, some people have been telling our citizens that they had lost control uh, of themselves and their society. But when you see uh, irregular migration used politically in the eastern border of Europe, you see that uh, uh, the governments don't claim national sovereignty, they claim European solidarity. When we are facing COVID, the governments don't claim national sovereignty and national response, but European response. And when we have a security threat, a big security threat, each individual country doesn't say, I will take care on my own. We say, let's go all together, let's take uh, uh, united uh, decisions. So for all those reasons, first, we must protect our federal achievements, if we can call it that way, the euro and the integrity of Schengen. And secondly, let's not listen always to those that say that we have lost control because they are the same that face to a real threat. They say, let's play European. And on the, on the fiscal rules and the debt, uh, we must stick also, I mean, of course, to, 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 to the rules and the principles. But if we ask our citizens, and that's the only important thing at the end, what they think, it was better the way we dealt with the financial crisis, or they are more happy as we have dealt with this crisis. I haven't heard one single voice, one, in the whole Europe saying we did it wrong this time. We heard many voices saying we did it very poorly the last time. So that's a fair hint mm -hmm. of where we should go if we think that we must respond in democracy to our citizens and not to our own ideological ideas. Thank you. Mr. Metz, maybe uh, briefly, because you're between the audience uh, questions and the panel. No, go ahead, please. If yeah? you want to open the podium, it's okay. fine. So I, because I already have three people on my list, so if you um, want to pose a question or make a comment, just um, raise your hand, wave, or do whatever to catch my attention. Or you can also use uh, Slido and send your question uh, yeah, uh, via Slido. Uh, first on my list, and please excuse, I have a terrible facial recognition, and 
with the mask is killing me, so if I don't know uh, your name. So uh, the lady in pink, red, yeah. <laughs> and could you introduce yourself, please? And My name is Lia Quartapelle and I'm an Italian member of parliament. I very much like what Prime Minister Kaja Kalla said about uh, what the, the results we got are results from previous crises, of what we learned from previous crises. What we learned, or what comes out of this crisis, is also the existence of a true European public space. Mm -hmm. uh, we compared a lot policies of other countries, whether in Germany schools were open, how the vaccination campaign went in Portugal, and so on. But also, what we got from this crisis is new needs and new questions. There is a wave of great resignation. We understand there is a wave of divorce. We understand there is a lot of fatigue on women. So my question is, what are the new needs that come out of this crisis and how we collectively can respond to these needs that are European needs? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I intend to uh, take questions in groups to uh, give you more room uh, for your interventions. And next on the list is Sylvie Kaufmann. Thank you very much, Sylvie Kaufmann, uh, French newspaper Le Monde. Uh, following up on Mr. Mert's comments about um, uh, foreign policy, um, do you, um, I would like to have the other speakers' um, uh, assessment of this. Uh, we, we have been told since the beginning of this conference about uh, how the level of unity uh, in, in the Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis has been impressive and strong uh, among Europeans and in uh, the transatlantic alliance. Do you see this European moment uh, as potentially transformative for, for Europe as, you know, as the uh, recovery plan was also transformative in terms of uh, fiscal policy, potentially? So I, I would like to have your, your views on this. And also, uh, there was a question earlier about some leaders acting individually, and I think that was for uh, Macron and Scholz going to, to put in. Uh, do you see this as a problem or as a, um, an asset? <laughs> Thank you. And the gentleman in the second row over here. I have a very strong kind of left side uh, of the room. The right side so far uh, is uh, silent. So if you want to ask a question, uh, then raise your hand. Okay, my name is Nico Peleshe and I am the uh, Minister of Defense of Albania. Uh, so I have a question about the EU integration of our Western Balkan countries. Thank you, Mr. Merz, that you uh, mentioned and shared with us your vision about the uh, EU integration of Western Balkans, and uh, we have to say that Germany has been always a strong supporter, not only politically, morally, but also financially. You have invested a lot. And also the Prime Minister of uh, Belgium said that in times of crisis, Europe takes steps forward. And now refer to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. There are provocations there, but the 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 good news is that EU or NATO member countries, they, were, they are more united now than before the conflict. So uh, is it not maybe the time, this is my question, that maybe EU has to speed up the integration process for Western Balkan countries? Because, because sometimes our, let's say, sticking to this process is not because of us not doing the home tasks, but sometimes it's because of internal member countries' political problems. Uh, like in our case, for example, we are in a package with North Macedonia, and North Macedonia is blocked by Bulgaria mm -hmm. for kind of historic debates and so on. Mm -hmm. So is it now the time to reflect and decide to speed up this process, very important one, and to build a success story for EU in Western Balkans, where we have, we have other rival of our values, countries like Russia and China, they want to, they want to, they, they offered us investments and so on, but we have decided to link our development with EU integration mm -hmm. processes, not with the rest. 
Thank you very much. Um, I already have a second round uh, of people um, lined up, so I give it back to the panel first, and I ask you to consider this as some sort of speed dating with the audience. <laughs> um, so um, we have a question um, on the new needs uh, of the, the crisis for, for citizens and how uh, kind of to take them into account. Also, I think this mentioning of a European public uh, sphere was very interesting because I'm still looking for one and I have quite a, actually trouble finding the European public um, sphere. But um, I, that is one of the questions then to you particularly, uh, Mr. Merz, um, is the kind of the level of unity that, um, that we saw here in the past three days on the uh, challenge that Russia poses, is this uh, kind of transformative? Um, and maybe uh, if one of you wants to comment on some member states uh, going it alone and whether that helps uh, to enhance cohesion or whether it weakens cohesion. And then I would actually like maybe all of you to comment briefly on the very last question, the uh, access and que accession question, uh, enlargement uh, question, because I think it's a crucial question because the argument of those that say we cannot enlarge right now is that we have to keep our club together first and there are so many uh, crises and powers that tear us apart. If we enlarge now, that would kind of undermine our cohesion and not strengthen it. Mm -hmm. So maybe we do a round of speed dating and yeah. Okay. Ladies first. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Prime Minister. Um, first of all, I think uh, it's too early to tell what are the uh, lessons from these crises. The next one came immediately after and, and it's, it's uh, hard to really reflect now, but, uh, but I think uh, some, uh, some issues uh, are already seen uh, that, uh, uh, that also we need unified approach, for example, and we can do, uh, you know, quite fast uh, unified approach to digital sphere, for example. I mean, digital identities that we have been talking uh, forever, and it was like, yeah, you know, Germany can't have a digital identity, and that's why we can't have a digital identity in Europe, uh, so that, uh, you know, it could function uh, on online, but we did, in two uh, months, we did the digital certificates for COVID, which is actually, you know, one step further, further is, is what we can uh, do, uh, uh, the digital identities for everybody that could solve so many issues in the cyberspace. Um, that's one thing. Um, regarding uh, um, this uh, security crisis and the unity there, um, the question uh, for us, I think, um, um, this um, is, uh, is showing that um, so far we have those voices that, you know, they in Europe, they in Europe decide something, they in Europe. And, and I've always said uh, in, in Estonia that we are Europe, we are as equals as, you know, German or France is at those tables. We have been in the European Union for 17 years. We are Europe. Um, and, um, and as I said, it's not geography, but principles. And, and now uh, it is really seen that, uh, that we are equally listened to. And, and when the question was uh, about Macron and Scholz going to Moscow, uh, we were uh, consulted before, we were consulted afterwards. Uh, we are, uh, you know, equals. We really feel that we are listened, being listened to, which is a great, a great thing. And the last thing about Western Balkans, uh, when we were joining European Union and NATO, it was a dual track approach. So, so if you know NATO door was closing, then you know European door was opening, and it was it was like that. Uh, so, so therefore, I have also proposed on the European level that you know if it is very hard to uh, you know make steps uh, regarding NATO, uh, you know. European doors should be more open uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, we had huge discussions about uh, North Macedonia, but I'm, I have huge hopes, I hope can, I, I can say uh, publicly here uh, for the new Bulgarian government in this respect. I had a uh, good meetings with, with um, a new prime minister, so uh, putting the hopes there. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> so on, 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 I'll take two elements. First on, 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 on Western Balkan, um, there is a process Let's stick to the process. We know that, I mean, it takes time to go through all of this. I think there should be no coupling of one country with another. I think every country should be evaluated on its own, uh, on its own merits. Um, is it possible to speed up? 
it's possible to speed up on how fast you achieve the milestones, but I think it's important to stick to the milestones. On foreign relations, I just wanted to, to, to do a concept on that. There is a bit of discussion on, you know, as Europe, do we have hard power or do we use soft power? I think actually as Europeans we have something else. And, and the other thing we have is, I would call it seductive power. I think we're good at seducing people. And, and, and seducing people is something very different. Yeah, you can smile about this and you can have a lot of stories about what it means. But, but with hard power alone, do, do you think today the ones using only hard power at our eastern borders, do you think they're seducing someone? You're not seducing someone with hard power. And the United States used to be very seductive. What was the seductive element of the United States? It was the American dream. And everyone wanted to be part of the American dream. I'm not sure this is the most seducing idea anymore because they lost it a little bit. So what do we have? I mean, what is, how do we seduce someone? How do we actually make someone stronger? Because the process of seducing someone is not only make yourself look good, it's also make the other person feel stronger, want to be part of this relation. For me, it's very simple things. It's quality healthcare, um, which is affordable. It's quality education, which is affordable. And it's the good life. In Europe, you don't have to be at the top 1% to have a good life. I mean, middle income people, even lower middle income uh, people can have a good life. And it's something we should uh, put more, uh, more forward. Now, if you want to be good at seducing, you also need some hard power and you need some soft power. But I think that's what makes, uh, makes Europe unique. And I think we should develop it much, uh, much stronger. Thank you. Foreign Minister. I will uh, continue on foreign policy. I, I think that going from unanimity to qualified majority, uh, it's something that we need to really move forward because there is a real disparity in European Union. We, we are a superpower in things like democracy or human rights. If we tell one country you are not fulfilling with human rights or with democracy, that's a terrible blame. No one wants that from us. We pay a lot. We are a superpower in development aid. We put money in many of the crises. At magic, by magic, we have no political weight on those issues. So usually we put the sanctions, all that do the political dialogue. Some others put the political framework, we pay and we make the investment coming from European Union. Why we cannot match? our real muscle with the brain. It's as if we had the muscles, but we didn't have the brain, which is completely ridiculous. That has a lot to do on how we do European Union foreign policy, and I think we have to move forward. Some hard power from us, it's also needed. This is the right time. We are with the strategic compass right now. We are thinking about it. Do we think the European Union must have a say in different parts of the world? If yes, what do we need in order to do it? That's the reflection. And on Western Balkans, of course, enlargement is, is, is a must. We have to move forward, and Spain is committed, of course, to that enlargement. Thank you. Mr. Matz? Um, I agree with what has been said here on the podium, mostly, but I would like to focus on the question, is this a transformative moment? Yeah. And I think that this is definitely a transformative moment. Mm -hmm. And this is in a row with European history. European history has never been a steady, slow moving development upwards. It was always a history of decisive moments, disruption, and then more integration. And, and my guess is that we are now witnessing such a moment such a decisive, transformative moment where the European Union has to decide what they really want. And there is one challenge ahead of us, which will we most likely see in a couple of days or weeks, and that is a new refugee crisis mm -hmm. on the Polish border. What will we do then? And my question goes to those who are now in charge in the governments and in the European Council. Are you prepared? to tackle 
such a new refugee crisis in Europe. Is the Polish government willing to activate Frontex immediately from the first moment on and to cooperate with all the European member states because this is not the Polish-Ukrainian border? Do you think that would be the appropriate reaction to activate Frontex when we see kind of to a major activate, migration activate, crisis coming from Ukraine? To yeah, to activate all the institutions we have to understand this potential crisis as a European challenge and not just a challenge on the Polish-Ukrainian border. So but this, wouldn't this the more appropriate solution then be to think of who can take how many Ukrainian exactly. refugees? Are we having preparation of a mechanism okay. to distribute those who might come? So are we prepared mm -hmm. differently to what we experienced in 2016? Okay. So is, is this now something which the European Union is aware of? Okay. And is the European Union really preparing such a challenge which could happen I think it's an excellent the question days. which we can um, include in the second round of, uh, of questions and uh, ask it basically to the uh, yeah, heads of state here and the, the foreign minister. Um, but I would like to first um, take other questions from the floor and I have Constanze Stelzmüller. As I said, a very strong... Oh, okay, was... Yeah, <laughs> then... Ah, Constanze was first, but... <laughs> Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'll just read in the, the uh, forward by uh, Wolfgang Ischlinger. I remember coming here and there was westlessness was the, the key word. Um, Wolfgang's moved from westlessness to helplessness. Mm -hmm. My question to the panel is, do you think in the next five to ten years on the current trajectory the world is going to get more safer or less? And if the answer is the latter, is it time to increase NATO defense spending to 3%? And as a passionate uh, lover of European security, investing in European security from a British perspective, could you outline the disparity between NATO's responsibilities and duties and the European Union's uh, aspirations, it seems, to develop its own defense capabilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Constanze Stelzmüller and then Roderich Kiesewetter. Hello there, Constanze Stelzmüller, King's Institution. Um, I have what may be, well, probably is a tricky question. And it's, and since we are in Germany here with German hosts, um, I've noticed where I work in Washington, but also here, in fact, diplomats have told me that Germany bashing has become something of a thing in this crisis. Jana's nodding, she knows what I'm talking about. Now, I'm the last person to say, you shouldn't criticize my country when that is warranted. But there also seems to be an element of, you know, it's, it's become a phenomenon of its own. So what would be your advice, Madam Prime Minister, gentlemen, and, and you, Her Mouths, as what in Britain would be called Her Majesty's loyal opposition, um, what advice would you give this new German government on how to deal with this phenomenon? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Roderich Kiesewetter. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Roderich Kiesewetter from the German Parliament. Um, Friedrich Merz just spoke about the transformational moment we just experienced. Um, Your Excellency, Mrs. Kallas, you spoke about to include the youth and you all four spoke about societal cohesion. And our panel today is also about European cohesion and my question and proposal is beyond security policy. Mm -hmm. In front of this crisis we experience, we need to convince the youth in Europe to engage. And what if you were to go to, to promise a kind of societal support force, a civil support force, where the youth of Europe is spending one year of their life for, for example, blue light organizations across the border. So if we create something which is, be, which is beyond conscript armies and others, which is a voluntary service, but we, which is on purpose across the border in a 
country of, of the European vicinity, of the, in, in the European neighborhood. That means if we start a process that young French people go to Spain, young Portuguese people go to Germany and from Slovakia to Germany and from, from us to Poland, we could foster this. And if we engage our youth in blue light organization and something like that, we would create an added value. Could you just assess it and also try to bring this in the political processes? Thank you. Thank you, um, Roderich. So we have a question on migration, which has in the past been a huge threat to European cohesion. I think we can safely say that. So are we preparing um, for the next crisis? And I, I think most importantly, how? Um, then um, the notion of helplessness. And uh, so how can we be more resilient as Europeans and become a more forceful actor? Uh, kind of. Should we finally, I mean, we talk about the European Defense Union forever and its complementality to NATO, so is, is that a transformative moment maybe here? The Germany bashing question, so what would be your um, advice? And uh, the European uh, Voluntary Service, but I would connect this, uh, the last question also with, what would be actually your elevator pitch if you had 30 seconds and you had a young kind of uh, citizen of your country in front of you, highly skeptical about the European Union, what would be your kind of liner, or your one-liner, how to turn it around? We don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe we start this time with uh, Friedrich Merz, well, go the other way around? In, 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 in brief, um, uh, two answers. The first one is leadership within the European Union uh, on, on these different uh, issues. And second is what uh, my colleague from the German parliament asked, to give the younger generation a perspective to get involved and to help to resolve the problems. Because the, the precondition in my view is that the answer to our British colleague there, the world will become unsafer within the next couple of years, more or less the next decade. And it's completely open what happens at the end. We are under pressure. And that's the reason why we have to do anything what we can do. Leadership, clear structures within the European Union, focus on the, on the competencies the European Union really has, and to get the younger generation included. Was it 30 seconds? <laughs> no, yeah, but no, no, 30 seconds was only for this kind of part of the, the, the many questions. Not, you don't need to stick to it in total. Yeah. That's why I follow up on the Germany bashing question. Because um, how do you perceive this, like being in opposition, being highly critical with the German government yourself? Uh, how, what what yeah, do you well, make of it? We are used to that for many years, that this always is happening. But on the other hand, Germany is doing so much, not just on, on defense, but also on global responsibility in so many places in the world. I think there is no reason for Germany bashing. As long as we are sticking to our uh, obligations, as I said, in the European Union, and as long as we are willing to be under those member states who are really pushing this European Union ahead with a clear agenda for Europe and for our own country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Foreign Minister. Yes, I, I will uh, uh, tackle the question on migration because that's a very important one. That's one of the main challenges of, the, of, of, of Europe uh, nowadays. And also we will see more and more in the next few years, and I agree with you, the unacceptable political use of irregular migration to put pressure. It will be a sort of option to a real war. Huh? And we have to be ready for that. Of course, the, the answer of Spain, what we will do, it's already there by action. What we have been doing in the last few years is we are an external border of the European Union. We know very well the regular migration phenomenon and we take care of our load, our national load. But every summer and every time uh, Spain has been needed, we have also taken a part of the share of those boats that are with irregular migrants, and we have shown European solidarity. And this is very important, because what we are confronted in the migration issue is if we believe in European solidarity, or we only think that European solidarity is when we are this debating and discussing about European uh, uh, cohesion funds or a structural funds. If you think that European solidarity should be there in order to receive funds, you must also show European solidarity when you must take a load of something that is not so nice. Because at the end, 
irregular migrants don't come to Spain or to Greece or to Italy or to Poland, to, it can happen to any country, it comes to Europe. So if the scope of the problem is European, the only answer can be European. And that will show the real solidarity. And there was this idea of making young people make one year to, to spend in a sort of voluntary uh, program. I think that I, I, I would have to reflect exactly on that idea, but if we take what has been the most successful European program, Erasmus. Erasmus right. Exactly. So that's the right path. Mm -hmm starting from the beginning and to a young Spaniard if I could have 10 seconds to tell him something is one one just one clear thing your life would be not as good as it is without the European Union and as fast as possible we should take the Brits again into the program so, sorry I didn't as fast as possible we took we should take the Brits okay. to the program again yeah I think yeah. that depends very much also on the British yeah. position on yeah. this. <laughs> uh, but uh, we can try, always. Uh, so on, uh, the, Prime Minister de on, the, on the elevator pitch, I, I would use a line I read from uh, Tony Blair recently, who said, the problem these days is that politics is only about politics, whereas it should be about ideas and about solutions. And that's the big issue these days. The only thing that people see from politics is the opposition. I don't agree with you and I don't agree with yeah. you, like which is easy. I mean, that's easy. But the real thing that people expect from us is, you know, we might be from a different party, but what are we going to do together? And how do we go forward? And that is lost in these very polarizing times. And Europe is actually good at that. That's the success of Europe. I mean, the virtue of democracy is not the majority. The virtue of democracy is the protection of minorities. And no one in the world has been better than Europe in protecting, uh, protecting minorities. Then maybe r rapidly on, on defense and on should we increase spending. Look, if you, if you compare US spending and European spending, um, we do, I think, 40% of what the US does. So it's significantly lower. But if you look at the output, the output is 15%, one five. So today, our European defense spending is not one plus one is equal two or equal three. One plus one is equal one and a half. And that's because each one of us still have their own programs and their own standards right. and, and, and so on. And that for me is much more important than saying, oh, we had 2%, let's go to 3%. It's not so much about more spending, it's how do we spend it mm. and how do we put it, uh, put it together. And there we have a gigantic leap to make. And for us, NATO, is the cornerstone of our collective security. But NATO will function better if we Europeans pull our way together and if there is a better balance between the US side and the European side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on, on Germany, one small comment? Oh, on Germany bashing, yeah. Oh, come on, let's stop this. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, let's be clear in this crisis. Yes. I mean, is Germany a reliable partner? Yes. yes. Stop. Yeah. End of discussion. Absolutely. Germany is a reliable partner. And uh, I yeah. guess you agree, Prime Minister Kallas. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, first uh, on, on Germany. I mean, I've had this uh, have, question, tough, tough uh, weeks, uh, question <laughs> from, from the German, <laughs> German media all the time. So to criticize the German government for not giving the consent on the Horisters, uh, feeling very uncomfortable to be in the middle of uh, German internal political discussions. But it's, it's up to Germany to decide what they do and what they don't. But, uh, but as, as uh, Alexander said, uh, is Germany a reliable partner? Yes. Is a strong ally? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so nothing to see there. On the uh, European defence, I, I totally agree with you. We have to spend more on European defence. We have increased our, uh, our spending in defence. Uh, it's more than 2.4% now um, of our GDP. And, and of course, it's our own defence plus the collective defence. But what I'm worried about in these discussions is that, you know, making the armies of Europe stronger and make them cooperate, you know, is a good thing. Creating an, an alternative, you know, structure, um, a chain of command to NATO is problematic. And sometimes when I, I see around the European um, table the discussions on defence, I understand that for many countries in European Union who have much nicer neighbours than we have, 
you know, it's a nice theoretical discussion around <laughs> defense. For us, it's everyday worry. We actually have to think about this all the time. And, and, um, and therefore, I would be very, very careful. I mean, the transatlantic alliance is, is very important, uh, but uh, uh, making our army stronger is also important. Um, on um, the uh, uh, migration, I think what our adversaries have understood is that migration is the vulnerability of Europe. Uh, what we saw in the Belarus uh, crisis, why they are pushing uh, people over, over the uh, border, because they understand it's a vulnerability and it's only uh, something that we can deal together because as we started in the beginning in those discussions saying that the value for Europeans is the, you know, the way Europe functions that we don't have any borders. If uh, we have uh, huge pressure uh, from outside, and of course, uh, war refugees is a totally different topic, then, uh, you know, what, what, what could be or what will be the answer uh, is that, you know, Germany or, or Netherlands start to close their borders, which is the end of the European Union. And lastly, my elevator pitch for the uh, young Estonian who is doubting in European Union or Europe, I say that, uh, look, at our history, we have, in being in the geographical position where we are, we have two choices, either to be with Russia or to be with Europe. We have been with Russia, I can tell you it was not nice, so uh, Europe is the way. <laughs> <laughs> This is actually to the perfect bridge to the last question I got. We're uh, kind of nearing the finishing line here, and I think we have to end rather on time, but I got one question which I think sums nicely up the uh, kind of yeah, debates we were having also in the past um, three years, uh, three, three days, sorry, it was not that long, it, and it didn't feel like that at all. It was a huge pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, a faster integration of countries belonging to the former USSR, it uh, says here, would interfere again with the Russian need to a buffer zone. How do you deal with that? And it's, it's exactly, Prime Minister Kallas, if you say kind of either we are with Russia or we are with the European Union. Ukraine um, has, in 2014, made a choice. Oh, I mean, they had expressed a wish. The wish still stands. I think it's a, a wish that many other countries uh, share. We have talked about the Western Balkans. but precisely on Ukraine or mm. Georgia, but the, maybe yeah. make it about Ukraine and yeah. the European membership. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, as I said, Europe is not geography, but a uh, set of principles. So, so either uh, you, you, if, if a country wants to follow those principles instead of uh, those presented by some other countries, it's their choice, and, and uh, we have to, you know, take this into account. And, and of course, uh, what was also, you know, the question with the Western Balkans, I think uh, we can't kill hope. Uh, uh, because if the hope is killed uh, to um, join the European family and also, you know, follow the principles that we agree and stay true to the principles, then it's also a signal to all the other countries that might take up the path of democracy and, and, and you know, the principles that we follow in, in Europe, the values that we share here. So, so we, we can't kill hope. We have to make our own steps uh, if, if the countries are moving uh, forward. And, and we can't really break our promises that we have given uh, to those countries. Thank you. Final comment on this, Prime Minister. So the question was on, related to European membership or NATO? A faster integration of countries. I think it was on European, I mean, given that this is a panel on uh, European cohesion mm -hmm. and the European Union internal affairs, I take it as a question uh, on the European Union yep. membership perspective for yeah. Look, uh, we, we, know, we know there is a process and, and, and the, the acquis communautaire, as it is called, is fast, so it takes time to, make, to, to, to just grow to, uh, to each other. So I think <coughs> we need to respect the process, but also be clear that when milestones are achieved, we go forward. I mean, let's, let's not make it a moving target, which makes, which makes it um, in, uh, in, in, impossible. But I'm... I'm I mean, I think that the, the, the threats that have been made to NATO, um, to NATO membership that some countries would want, 
and that then Russia says, you know, it's our sphere of influence and so on. I don't think we're going to solve that with, with European and Union uh, integration. Yeah. And that, that whole concept of sphere of influence, I mean, that frightens me in the sense of then as a Belgian, I mean, what is, who can claim sphere of influence on us? I mean, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, I mean, everyone has been where we live uh, today. Um, so, so that's just a concept that is completely against evolution of history and, 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 and it's a, it's a backward looking perspective, which I mean, I think has been rejected enough during the, the past three days. Thank you. Foreign Minister Ibarez. Yes, on, on the accession, uh, there are rules and there are criteria that anyone has to, to meet. So that's very clear. But I think that the, the real question uh, inside that question is, uh, uh, is the European Union that decides who they are members as, and no one outside the European Union. And that's what's at stake right now. It would be the same answer for NATO. No one must decide who can be a member or not of European Union or NATO, except European Union and NATO members. And the, 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 the reality of what's at stake right now is we continue going forward toward the future, European Union, NATO, any regular organization decide about their members on their own criteria, of course, at their own rhythm, and giving the final possibility to themselves to say yes or no, but it's our decision. Or we go back to the past, a past that we don't want to see again, a past in which there were walls, there were spheres of influence, there were some countries that had full sovereignty and others it was only a little bit of sovereignty. Spain completely reject going back to the past. So we want to go to the future. That's very clear. Okay. Final remark, Mr. Mayor. Widening the European Union or NATO is actually not on the political agenda. But what we, I think, have to do now, and this word was mentioned during this weekend so often, is to increase resilience for us, for the European Union, for NATO. And I think there is all reason to be very self-confident to say there is no threat coming from this European Union or from NATO to anybody in the world. This is the consequences out of the process we've made 30 years ago. And there is one international agreement, 32 member states signed, including the US and Canada. And that was the Charta of Paris from 1990. And this is the framework for our political order on this continent. And that, let, let, let me just make one comment on, the, on Europe. What, what is Europe? Europe is more than the European Union. Europe is this continent. And to this continent, there are two big countries entirely belonging, and that is Russia and Ukraine. And by the way, these are the two, by territory, biggest countries in Europe. We all know that Russia is the biggest one in the world, but Ukraine is the second biggest one by territory for Europe. So we have to resolve this problem and then we can step by step try to come back to what we had in 1990 and this is the basis for our perspective in this century as a European Union which is ready to widen and to have better conditions for all of those who are willing to accept these rules which we laid down in 1990. Thank you very much. I think the panel has quite remarkably shown that the cohesion is uh, still under stress and that there are many challenges. We are, um, as Mr. Merz has uh, said, in a transformative moment. I think we could all agree on this, uh, not in a Hamiltonian moment, or oh, that is not quite clear yet, whether the transformative moment will be accompanied by a Hamiltonian um, moment or not. I very much liked uh, your remark, uh, Prime Minister Kallas, on a conference that is entitled Unlearning Helplessness to say we can't kill hope. Um, is, I think, something uh, that uh, for me, uh, yeah, uh, it could be the, the, the motto for the next uh, Munich Security Conference, um, maybe, um, because I, I was actually suggesting hopefulness as, uh, the <laughs> as another uh, possibility. Um, please now join me uh, in a round of applause for our panel, and then I ask the panel to leave the panel. <laughs> So, and now, before Wolfgang Ischlinger comes up here, 
I found out when I moderated, when I, when I was asked to moderate the panel, that I'm the last person who has a microphone before Wolfgang Ischinger talks. And I want to use this opportunity now because I have kind of the speaking power and you're standing next to me and I think I speak on behalf of all the participants of this conference and of the many conferences you organized. Um, we just, I think, I, I feel privileged to thank you for everything uh, what you did and I would like, before I leave uh, the uh, stage, to um, stand up and give a round of standing ovations and applause to Mr. Schindler.